Okay, we are live. Hello. I think <laughs> we are live. All right, let's see. Where is we are going to ask our friend Deidre to join. Uh, one moment. Where is she? The boxing lioness. I will figure this out. Hi everyone. Happy Sunday. Uh oh. Let me keep looking. Bear with me. Hello, hello. There we go. Lee has been doing all of these, so bear with me. I think I've asked her to join. Okay. Hey, everyone. Coach K Jem here with Girls Just Want a Box, and we are going to be talking to. There she is. Hi. <laughs> Hi, Deidre. How are you? Good. How are you? Good. Listen. Okay. Oh, okay. <laughs> I just touched too many things. I'm going to stop doing it. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> How's your Sunday so far? So far, so good. Productive, I should say. Already? Uh, yeah. On a Sunday. Okay. I'd like to hear. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> My oh, week, I'm... for me, my week starts on a Sunday. So, like, like a lot of people use their Sunday to prep, but that prep for me is, like, the start of a new week already, so. You're already starting Monday on Sunday. Yeah, Monday is day two of the week for me. <laughs> okay, okay. That's a good philosophy to have. Um, yeah. Okay, I think we need to just jump in. I think we've got a couple people here. Um I really, really always like to start these as kind of understanding, you know, where your boxing journey started. Um, mm. we'll, we'll kind of take a journey through the world of the boxing lioness and right. um, <laughs> how you ended up coming on board being one of our amazing ambassadors. Um, so yeah. let's, let's start with how did you get into boxing? What's your, what's your origin story, if you will? So my origin story really is like my dad was super passionate about boxing. He boxed himself. Um, so I was always around boxing before I even knew it was a sport and before I knew it was a sport that other people knew about. So like when, well, especially back in the day, like mm -hmm. boxing was not as common as it is now. So like if I told people about boxing, like I felt like people just didn't know about the sport in general. So when I, when they did know about it, I was like, well, you know what boxing is? Like, you know about the sport, especially like kids <laughs> that I both and stuff. Cause it just was unheard of. Okay, so what like, year was that though? What year was that? Oh, I was young. So we're talking Cause like- Cause I, I feel like your back in the day is different from my back in the day. Oh. So. <laughs> <laughs> let's address what year that so is. let's say like i was like i don't know five or six so like 2000s like early 2000s like 1999 okay. when like you're just in junior kindergarten it's different right like you I, were you were in junior kindergarten yeah i was graduating I, university so we're okay, gonna, we're gonna change that disparity <laughs> i'm okay i'm okay but so yeah. for me it's like a three, four year old knowing about boxing and talking about amongst other three, four year olds is different, right? Because these aren't sports that you are traditionally like introduced to. Right. Um, so anyways, for me, what was super, so my dad was into boxing. Um, he would run miles with us on his shoulders, us as in like me or my brother, like my dad would do like a 10 K with us on his shoulders and stuff. Wow. Like that. So, Where was this? Uh, in London, Ontario. Okay. Yeah. Okay. That must have yeah. been a sight to see. You know what? Um, I don't even know if I have videos of it anymore. Or I don't know. If, we didn't really have cameras. Well, we didn't use cameras as often as mm. we do now, right? Oh, yeah. Well, there was no, there was no, I no. Know everything. No, you know, so, um, so I was always around like an athletic background mm. and often watched my dad box. Um, what ended up happening is his boxing coach died of cancer and my dad took over the boxing gym. Mm. 
And so my mom helped my dad run the boxing gym for years. And um, I absolutely hated boxing. I thought it was the dumbest sport ever. <laughs> I was Why? so annoyed because I felt like I was always around it and I was never right. involved. Not that I wanted to be involved either, but like, because my parents were running the gym, I would go home. I Sorry, I wouldn't even go home from school. We would go straight to the gym. And then we'd sit in the office and do our schoolwork and watch movies and stuff. I thought the gym stank. I thought the boys were weird. I thought it was just gross. Like, everything about boxing was gross. And right. As you see, I'm sure everyone now still teases me about, like, being a super girly boxer. Because there's just things about boxing I still don't like till this day. Mm. That being said, so eventually, um, I, well, I always played soccer. I played mm. soccer from when I was, like, three years old up until I was, like, 20, 21-ish. And um, I never got to see other competitors other than my dad box and I used to play soccer all year round so I would compete um indoor and outdoor seasons but there was one season where I had a gap and they had a golden gloves tournament with the OBA in Kitchener and so my dad was like oh well you this is the first time you get to watch some competition so you should come and support your fellow and I'm just like, whatever, <laughs> right? <laughs> fellow, you know, family members <laughs> in the boxing club that I don't care to be around, you know, right? Anyways, so I went to the um, show. And um, there was some girls fighting. And I think they were only a year or two years older than me. And so they're like eight or nine. Yeah. So okay. uh, they were probably oh, at that 10. Point it was older. Okay. I think okay. it was older. I think you had to be like 10 or 11. So I think right. they were like 10 or 11 at this point. And um, listen, everyone was like, oh my God, they're so good. And they were like getting all these, this credit. Uh -huh. And I kid you not, in my eyes, before I even knew it was girls boxing, like this is the worst boxing I've ever seen in my life. Like I was so like <laughs> annoyed and like unimpressed. <laughs> and so when their headgear came off and everything and I saw it was girls, like I was like, really? So I said to my dad, so I hear everyone like hooping and hawing about these girls that are boxing and I'm like unimpressed. So I said to my dad, I was like, how old are they? He says, oh, they're a year older than you. I was like, all right, cool. I'll just box next year. <laughs> Cause I, I could do better than that. Yeah, literally. I was just like, I'm an athlete. Even if I've never boxed in my life, I mm -hmm. still feel like I would have beat both of those girls. So that's how I ended up getting into boxing. And um, <clears throat> I never trained for my first fight. Like, I just, I I was just kind of, like, thrown in there, literally. Part, right. part of the reason is because I've always been around this sport. So my dad just assumed I was comfortable, which I was comfortable. Yeah. And my first fight was actually against my own cousin. We were, like, the only 12-year-olds that are 100 wow. pounds. And so from there... Um, I kind of just fell into it and over the years like just progressed and before you know what I'm like I had no idea you know 10 years later I'd be this immersed into the sport. So that that first experience with boxing right like yeah. everybody you know you're you grew up around it so it was more familiar you yeah. saw people fighting and you're like I can do that but even better yeah. and then you got that competitive juice flowing you're like I got this I really yeah. like it. So when you got in the ring and had that first experience, was your dad in your corner? He was not. Oh, okay. yeah. So, so no one else was. Yeah. So my mom was because oh, it, was, it was it was myself against my cousin and my cousin oh. boxed in our same gym. Right. right. And so realistically, um, like for conflict of interest, it was only fair for my dad to be in her corner, right, considering right, right. she actually was trying to box. And I was just like doing boxing for the sake of it. Right. But don't get me wrong. <clears throat> I was always a very competitive person. And I was, you know, playing soccer at the highest level at that time. So athleticism right. wasn't my concern. And it wasn't my dad's concern. It was really more right. technique. But at that age, I think the biggest thing was just getting the experience. Whether it be right. good technique, bad technique. Like that will come along the way once I decide. Once he saw that's something I really wanted to do. So right. my dad actually was not in my corner. My mom okay. was in my corner. Which is fun. Yeah. And my dad wanted it to be a friendly competition. I don't know. Like, back then, friendly competitions was so unfamiliar to me. So <laughs> before I got into the ring, he said, you're not allowed to throw any right hands. And I was, like, pissed because, A, this is my first fight. Like, I want to win. 
and you take away my biggest like you know my biggest one of my biggest strengths <clears throat> and so anyways i lost the fight out of like just being emotional and like super angry mm. just like going in there and wanting to throw absolute bombs i lost the fight fair and square and i was so upset i was so angry but um but you loved it did you love the experience like no i hated being it in the I, ring? Lost. <laughs> I lost <laughs> that's all i cared about but after the fight my dad came to me and he said if i told you you could go back into the ring right now and have another fight would you and i was like yeah absolutely so he's like okay that's how i know that you're serious about boxing or you like to fight and you're not scared right. to fight that was his like un that that was his like okay if she wants to pursue this i'm willing to support her with it so was there any other you know as you continued on from 12 years old were you fighting a lot was it hard to find uh other athletes your age female athletes to spar with because we all know you know yeah male and female fighters fight totally different so what was your what was your experience being that young in the gym back in the early 2000s i was the only girl i was the youngest mm. and one of the smallest and in my eyes it was never excessive but in my eyes I, all of my sparring sessions were the absolute most challenging sessions ever and i just always felt like i was going to the gym to get pummeled i was never getting pummeled mm -hmm. but i was also never in dominating. your mind yeah because i was never dominating any sparring matches right i'm with these boys now they were always controlled and very disciplined sparring matches, but I always, I, I was always so frustrated sparring because I'm like, I never feel good. Like I never right. feel like I'm an actual good boxer because I'm with people that are more experienced, bigger, faster, stronger, and then there's me. But I was never shy from those experiences. Like mm. I just understood this is the process of preparing for a fight. Um, right. So I always sparred with boys. Mm -hmm. I didn't actually get to spar with females until I was about um, my first provincial experience. So from 11, I was probably about 14 before I actually got to spar with females. And and do you think, and now looking back, if you had the opportunity and there and there was, like like what we're doing now with the Girls Just Want to Box sparring Sundays, yeah. right? Every Sunday, we have a massive group of females from around Ontario, sometimes from Quebec. They all come to the gym and we all, you know, you get matched up and you get female sparring every yeah. last Sunday of the month. Um, do you think that would have been helpful for you back then or? For, okay, and here's where it comes very tricky, right? Mm -hmm. it really depends on the person you are and the athlete that you are for mm -hmm. me i don't i wouldn't have done anything differently mm -hmm. um and the reason why is because i can be so headstrong about things where i always need to be challenged and okay so here's the difference sometimes it's good to spar your own match so that mm -hmm. you're at that level and if you want to work on certain things like you have that ability because you don't have somebody that's overly dominating what you're doing mm -hmm. i find that really important i also find it important for you to be able to be confident in your um, own ability before you go into competition and mm -hmm. sparring people that are at your same level or in the same category is great for that if that's what that athlete needs like some people mm -hmm. need like a boost some people need need the pick me up and there's absolutely nothing wrong with that because but boxing is super psychological mm -hmm. for me in this case though i'm somebody that gets very easily too comfortable mm -hmm. and if i'm always sparring someone that's my own match um sorry i just want to i'm just gonna turn off that sorry okay yeah sure if i'm somebody that gets too comfortable i stop doing what i need mm -hmm. and so i feel like for me that competition i was okay going into a fight without like because i never felt like i wasn't good but i always felt right. like i never had a good sparring match mm. and so um I also know athletes and like even friends of mine where it's like very important for them to be able to be in the ring and practice certain things mm -hmm. before they go into their own competition. So there's right. more like a more even sparring match. Um, right. so I wouldn't have done it differently for me. And I think yeah. it made it easier for me to be able to work with people that don't have the same amount of experience, mm -hmm. but for me to develop that um, that discipline. So if I'm in with somebody that's not bigger than me or they're mm -hmm. smaller or it's their first experience, 
being on the flip side because that was mm -hmm. once me and yep. so now i'm in and believe it or not that's where i learned the most yeah because now the idea is for me to be more skilled than you know the stronger the or the more um like the 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 more aggressive fighter i guess to say so was your father always your coach <laughs> When did that transition? He was not. So um, my dad coached me up until I was 17 or 18. Okay. okay. So How old are you now? I'm 26. You're 26. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And then um, in between then, I would often go, even though my dad was still coaching me, I would often go to Mississauga and I would train with Chris Johnson. Mm -hmm. And him and I would do like a lot of personal training. And and we did a lot of pads, right. um, working on combinations and just showing me a different style of boxing. Chris saw me like one of my like very early stages of boxing. And he was mm -hmm. always like... Um, very encouraging and he always knew like i was somebody that wanted to fight like he's like i can see the fight in you i just want to work on the more technical side and he was the first person to introduce me to like a technical side of boxing with a different mm. style because all coaches are different and i used to <coughs> with dad so that was the first time i worked with a different coach but chris was mm. not my coach um, and, and do you think having I'm a true believer in having many coaches. You'll Absolutely. always learn something from each coach. And if you're kind of stuck in a situation where one coach, like I've had situations where I worked with a coach who wouldn't let me talk to anybody else, right? That yeah. whole that whole situation, if a coach is not open to letting you learn from other coaches, that's a bit of a red flag. Yeah, absolutely. Um, for sure. For me, I agree. I think it's so important to have that versatility um, that diversity, having the, your own adaptability. So being able to work with other coaches. And I yeah. think something that I learned very young because my dad wasn't able to work my corner. So for me, I always knew that I would have to be very adaptable, adaptable to other people's coaching styles. Right. If I was going to a club show or a tournament, I wouldn't know who's going to be in my corner. I just know I'm fighting. Right. And so being able to work with other people is in boxing is the same thing across the board in life. You need to be right. able to work with other people. You might not like at the moment who they are, whatever the case is, but mm -hmm. that's actually a life skill. But I got that life skill through boxing. Right. And so I Very work cool. significantly with a couple of different boxer, um, boxing coaches. And every single, I've walked away from every single coach was something that I will forever keep in my, you know, skills. Mm -hmm. And so take us a bit through your journey through, okay, you've had a few fights. They were amazing. You still had a lot to learn. Mm -hmm. um, and then how quickly did you get to a provincials <laughs> and then a nationals type of situation? Okay, so <laughs> when I started boxing, my dad says to me, I'll make you a national champion. I was like, 11 i had no idea what a national champion is i didn't know like i didn't know these terms but i'm like okay right. i just want to fight and win so when i boxed I, I think i boxed for the oba for like a year maybe and if it, anybody doesn't know oba was another organization not boxing ontario the ontario boxing association which is right. now not in existence but both and, and i also had my first fight in oba so that was right. It would be, we had dueling organizations at one point. Yeah. Now it's just boxing Ontario. So you were fighting in OBA. Uh, I only had only like three or four fights against right. my own cousin. So really, right. yeah. So which, <laughs> I didn't which have any, other, I didn't have any other opponents. <laughs> <laughs> so when I, I switched, yeah. yeah, so when I switched over, I believe I actually switched over under Chris Johnson's gym at the time. I think mm. I'd have to ask my dad, but I'm pretty sure that yeah, was yeah. the terms. So anyways, um let me think here so provincials, I, road to provincials yeah so the road to provincials i fought at the arnie beam um tournament and i fought tamara thibault um who is now on the national team we were out previously on the national team together but before that she was one of my first um fights she was one of my first fights like with somebody that i didn't know right and so i fought <laughs> her a family member yeah that was it <laughs> So she was one of the first people that I fought. Um, and that same, I think a couple weeks later, we had provincials. And I I don't think I had a competitor. I don't think I had an opponent. So I believe I won by walkover. 
um and i was on the i was on the provincial team and at the time it was tom hennessy and tom hennessy would always have training camps in sarnia we would go there from i think like thursday to sunday or friday to sunday and everybody would stay there and we would train two to three times a day um sparring including fitness tests included and everything it was amazing so one of the best experiences i personally had boxing um anyways so we had like three or four provincial camps before we went to nationals and nationals was in saint heights in quebec in the middle of the winter it was freezing cold and usually when you at my age and at my size when you go to nationals you win by walkover usually every time i went i had at least two to three competitors mm. which was great and what was your weight category then i bought 66 kgs as a junior um and i think i switched over to 64 as a youth and what's and that then, in pounds just so people know if they don't understand kilos um i think Six 66 is like 145 to 140 mm -hmm around yep. that yep right and so my first fight was against a girl named jasmine and she was um she was from pa i believe <clears throat> okay so i went in there and i had stage fright i went and this is oh. what it is for system yeah so this was the first time i was completely out of my own element i wasn't in ontario I was not with any coaches that I typically train with. I think it was Bob Wilcox and Cedric Ben in my corner at the time. So it was and provincial coaches. Those were the ones. Yeah. Um. Well, yeah. well, Tom Hennessy was the head coach. And I think that they were also coaches there. I don't know if they were actually the provincial coaches. Right, but right. All the, there's so many of us that all right. the coaches kind of had to be involved. And it was great. Everybody worked together. There was like, it was a co completely different culture back then. So... Okay. They're in my corner. They all know I can box. They've all had seen me sparring in the training sessions. And I get in the ring and I don't throw a single punch for like three rounds straight. I used to box four rounds, four one minute rounds. And I kid you not, I did not throw any punches. Wow. <laughs> I don't know why. I was like, I think it was really just being completely out of my element. Right. So finally, um, the last round comes. I think I was down by like, I don't know. I was probably down by like 10 points. I'm you not had to be, okay. yeah. Like, I was being absolutely schooled. And then I finally started boxing. Like, I think it was the last 30 seconds of the fight. And I won. <laughs> so I end up winning. And to be honest, it was like, I should have, I should have like won the fight from long before we got to right. the um, But I, anyways, that was a big learning experience. So I won. So my dad was like, you know, he's like, what the hell happened? And to this day, I was just like, you know what? I don't think I woke up until that point. That was really right. like the biggest difference. So then here comes, we're back at nationals. I fought and I might in the finals, I was fighting Tamara. What year was this? <sighs> it had to have been like 2010. Okay. Yeah, it had to have okay. been about 2010. And so I fought Tamara at Arnie Beam, and then her and I are in the finals again. And we were like two young kids in high school. We had, we were beefing. We didn't like each other. <laughs> like it was, <laughs> we laugh about it now because we're friends. Yeah. But like before, we didn't like each other. Right. And so we go into the finals, and um, I won the finals. And I won my national title. And it, it was extra better because I was beefing this girl, and we didn't like each other at the time. <laughs> So what was so funny is so when I come out of the ring, I won, but I was just happy that I won against the girl that like was talking crap with me. And then my dad goes, do you know what this means? I was like, no. And he, um, he's like, you're a national champion. I was like, great. <laughs> I still didn't know what the hell that meant. Right. So goes, I love this that. Means that you're number one in Canada. There's nobody that is, that has a higher title than you. Yeah. And then that's where it said. And I was like, wow, I'm the best in my own country. And what was great now that I, I love is the fact that I didn't win by walkover because I know mm. so many people, especially females, and I don't take it away from them. You can't control yeah. what their opponents are. But Correct. they have like four or five national titles from walkovers. But this is, this, is, this is a good point, though, that to say, okay, what this is, this is why we need more women in the sport. And we need not everybody's going to have a dad who's a coach, right? Yeah. And, and mm. we've got to get those younger girls in the, in the sport from from day one yep. because if you don't have people to spar with you, you don't have the opponents then the, then it's just walkovers and are you really being tested as an athlete and what right. is all are the work for mm -hmm. 
Right. Yeah. But it's, it is honestly, uh, you know, 10 years later, there's, there's a lot more women in the sport, but yeah. we've got so to different support now. them. It is very right. different. And they've, you know, we've got to figure out the ways to support them or whatnot. So winning the national title, now you are, okay, wait, I'm a national athlete. So this yeah. is the thing. Yeah. <laughs> so how was your experience as a national athlete? Because I think you won quite a few years in a row, right? Or, I did. So I yeah. have four Canadian national titles as a champion, and then I have one silver medal. So overall, I think I competed at five. Yeah, I competed at five national championships for Canada. Um, so what does that mean? You're now national champion. You didn't know what it meant, but then <laughs> what did it mean? And what was your journey being on the national team? Good and the bad. So what it's supposed to mean is now you okay. represent your country across the board. Um, I was young, so I think at the time there could have been like world championships. And so you were the youth at the beginning? You were the youth I was champion? junior. So I won. Junior. Yeah, so I won junior, I think twice. No, I won junior once. I won youth once. And then I won national this is so bad. I won one uh, senior, silver, and so no. So yeah, junior, yeah. I have one senior national championship, okay. two youths, and a junior. So and as a youth athlete, yeah. what, what was that experience? I didn't have an experience team? as a youth athlete okay. on the Canadian national team. We, what does that mean? We didn't do anything. So what it's supposed to mean when you win is that you represent mm. your country, you train with the national team. And there was nothing instilled for me or anyone that was <clears throat> competing at that time. Um, the boys is different. But for the girls, um, I didn't go to any championship, uh, sorry, any competitions locally or even internationally as wow. a youth or a junior. Um, I think there was only one opportunity for me to go as a youth, um, and that was a training camp that was going to happen in the U.S. I didn't end up going um, because I had some family issues at the time. Mm -hmm. um, somebody very close to us had passed away. So that I, I missed that opportunity due to that. Um, and then... <clears throat> so three years as a you know junior youth athlete, you had one opportunity for a boxing training camp. And what was... So what was the point? What was the rest of the time it was just to say you were the champion and not there was no development of you as a youth female athlete so i mean through the through the national program there was absolutely no development whatsoever but i was still doing my own stuff of you course know, and, mm. um doing camps and all that stuff but through the national team there was nothing there was absolutely mm. no development no training camps no communication like nothing who was who was the head coach at the time um couldn't even tell you other than I know wow. it was still Daniel Trippinier that was head and in charge but anything else upon that I have no answers for you so when you then became that but you still kept going You're yeah like, I still I'm kept still fighting just, to be titles. honest it's, it's sad to say but I didn't even know like that these are things that are supposed to happen as a youth and as a right. junior I didn't know that either right like I didn't know what other countries were doing boxing mm. wise because I didn't have that exposure because we didn't have anything beyond what your coaches did. So like I had my dad and I was fortunate enough, but there was definitely other coaches in Ontario that were that going out of their way to make sure that their boxes are getting the exposure and the development that they need. But they, we didn't have that support from our national team. So I didn't know anything. Like I didn't know that's what other countries were doing. So but when you go to the national team, sorry for interrupting, when you go uh -huh. to the national team, you're mm -hmm. not at that time was it still the philosophy you had national team coaches not your actual coaches no. when you traveled no okay so even when i had one as a junior and as a youth i was still being coached by my provincial coaches when okay. i went there and usually how i guess at the time i was told i'm told that well i know now but yeah. usually if you're the national champion you automatically if there's ever a draw you automatically mm. get your you like you go to whatever the next um whether like it depends how many are in your th I always had to fight from the beginning so I did the prelims okay. quarters semis whatever the case is but usually if there's a draw I would automatically go to the next round I wouldn't have to do prelims but I fought at all of my competitions right from prelims to finals as an, a provincial athlete even though I was a national the, the reigning national champion okay so then when you moved to senior mm -hmm. did that change did the experience change 
Uh, the experience changed. Um, we, at the time, they still were not actually doing anything to monitor your progress. So what they, what year was this now? We're in the early, so in like 20, 20... 2016. Okay, so now we're all the way in 2016 into right. senior national champion. Okay, and now yeah. we're, where did the Olympics fall into play with any of this? So um, everything was the, the year prior, like qualifiers were the year mm -hmm. prior. So they already had the Olympic team and everything was set. Well, keep in mind with the females, again, we weren't, we weren't in the Olympics until 2012. Right. Right. So then, and the weight classes were still minimal, but you were in an Olympic level weight class. Is that correct? I was. Yeah. Okay. But okay. everything was the, all of the rounds and qualifications were done the year prior. So I was still a youth and I was boxing as a senior at that time. I okay. won as a senior in 2016. Um, and um, again, so this is where you ended up making some big decisions, right? Um, no, I think my biggest decisions were prior to 2016. So my biggest decisions about yeah. leaving my dad was done in 2014, 2015 is when yeah. I stopped training with my dad. I moved to Toronto from London, Ontario. And I was training with um, Adrian Tudorescu. Mm -hmm. And that was an amazing experience. And that's where I got the most development because- Is that I where you started training with Mandy? Yeah. With Mandy Bujo? Yep. Yeah. And there was and more females time, there. Right. So that was 2015 because at the time she had the Pan Am Games. Yeah. Um, so just the experience and being with females at my level was- mm -hmm completely career changing i got the yeah. best development at the time we had the best females across the board in one gym mm -hmm. um and adrian did really well to focus on his high performance athletes and really developed every single one of us and we were sparring consistently and i think it was the consistency with the sparring and yeah. the level of competition amongst yourselves mm -hmm. um among amongst us that was like great for every single female that was in the gym and I, and again, that's kind of, you know, going back to us having the every Sunday female sparring is it's for all levels. Yeah. So whether you've never gotten in the ring to spar, whether you just Absolutely. want to go and watch, maybe network, Absolutely. meet some people, or it's your high level, potentially, mm -hmm. you know, uh, you know, national level, you've had more than 50 to 100 fights. Like, mm -hmm. that's the great part about having all those women at the gym from all most, different gyms, right? It's definitely. not just our gym. No, absolutely. And I think what's even great about that is like, believe it or not, you learn the most and you work with somebody that knows less than you, in my opinion. The reason mm. why is because you now have to be the smarter person. You now have the time to, you know, focus on things that you sometimes will overlook when you're in with there with somebody that's higher at a higher so level. So you're saying you're saying being a higher level athlete and then working with the lower level athletes to push them, but again, work on something else. Mm -hmm. Is that what you mean? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, yeah that's a good point. It's a great way to develop your own skill with uh, like under lower, lower pressure and lower intensity. That's I a just great like, point. I just feel like I've always found myself to be more um, focused when I do that. That's a great idea because I think a lot of, you know, some of the female athletes that maybe are super, super high level don't always think about that. And that's also a way to give back. Right? It's a way to, to give back. Yeah. Absolutely. And for me, it's when I'm the most disciplined. The last thing I want to do as a high performance athlete, getting in there with somebody who's probably their first time in the gym, just wanting to learn about the sport is deter them mm -hmm. by pummeling them, over dominating them, yeah. losing my temper, being undisciplined. I want people to know that you can have friendly sparring sh sessions. For sure. If you're not, boxing is actually one of the most friendly sports ever. It's more friendly than soccer. It's more friendly than hockey. I'm telling you. It's true. I, I'd say it's even more friendly than figure skating because back in the yeah, day, those, yeah. those figure skaters, <laughs> I they were they were exactly. <laughs> and so the last thing that I want to do is deter another woman from getting into my sport because uh, of being a bully, intimidation, physical intimidation, meant, like none of that. I want to. Right. I want women in our sport. You know what I mean? Right. And so. For me to be disciplined, okay, I can still get punched, you know, like you're not going to shower without getting wet. So even if you're in there with True. the novice and they catch you, you're like, okay, what's going on? You're already on <laughs> that happen? Because you don't want to look bad either, right? 
Yeah. <laughs> Um, and I and I think it's really interesting what we've we've been doing this. I, I I can't even remember. We've been doing this for like four or five months now. Mm -hmm. Even once we were able to get back in the ring again, having female coaches there, having other male yeah. coaches, and just getting used to that environment, so that yeah. when you go into an actual fight, it's not like 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 how you said when you finally traveled and went somewhere else, and you were just like, "What is going on?" Oh, Colleen said yeah. since April. To clarify, we've been doing this monthly since April. I have only ever had one female coach in my corner. Okay. And over my years, I've never actually trained with a female coach. Right. And when I would travel, that was the biggest thing. Like, I always thought to myself, it would be so nice to have a woman that understands the sport, but understands what I'm going through as a female athlete as well. Right. And it was almost like you would see other countries with female coaches and you would be like, that's exactly what I need. Jealous. It's a different, it's, it's a different relationship. You know what it I is. mean? It's a yeah. different comfort zone. Um, and so now to see that, I'm happy for everyone else behind me because I always used, again, to being the only girl. Even when we would travel, we didn't have female coaches. Right. And luckily, that's changing. That's something mm -hmm. that we're trying to encourage. And you yeah. got into coaching a little bit yourself now. Um, um, I got into coaching very young. I actually yeah. did my, my um, certifications at, like, I think I was 15 or 16. It was Adrian that was my, the doing the courses at the time. Right. So I right. got certified up to level two coaching. Um, and my dad would have me do the kids classes and the intro to boxing. And we would actually go on to the reserves here in London and we would do um, boxing camp, after school boxing camp for the kids out there. That's well. amazing. Mm -hmm. So, so I, you know, I have this, not, not that I have this argument, but like over the years of, you know, the past decade of really focusing on all female classes and development. I sometimes would even get pushback from the female fighters being saying, and I get this from male coaches, I'd love to name them, but I won't, that say, that say I, I was at a camp and I said, well, you know, what's your development stage? Why don't you have an all-female class? Or oh, we don't, they don't want that. Women don't want all-female classes, you know, they can, they can join with the boys. And I'm like, no, they can join with the boys, but a lot of, it's a different vibe, it's a different energy, and we can it can be a different, a lot more inviting, right? As an all female class. And at the end of the day, we're fighting females. So for the way our development works is that you're all female until you're at the competitive level, then you're a co-ed team. And then the team mm -hmm. is co-ed because it's a little bit of a backwards thinking where not, I think it's not backwards, but the old school way is guys and girls, guys and girls. Oh, and now you're an all female thing. Well, that, I don't, I don't know if that is the way to go. Um... That's actually a tricky one. I can give you, I can, so I'm somebody that I can look at both perspectives. Yeah. And I think, again, the biggest thing, I don't think there's ever a, a right or wrong way of doing something, but mm -hmm. one thing will work good for one person and not the other. Yep. I think doing it where it's all females up until you're competing and then it's co-ed, I, I feel like that could be a shock to some people because it's a for different environment that you're not familiar with. So, and, but, but, but you're never fighting the men. Right? No, 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 no. you're never fighting the men, but you're amongst them. So it's like a different, like, so, um, so to clarify on that, I'm not saying that you're only in an all women's gym and there's never men around because there's always going to be a male coaches, right? right. There's always going to be other male fighters. Yeah. Right. That's around in that environment. Right. But once you get, once you're both a, you know, a female, uh, competitive out of the beginning levels, right? Yeah, over 10 fights, you should you're at the same level. So you can spar together. And it's an, a little bit of a more even playing ground than having even two first beginners, right? Because nobody's always able to control themselves. Yeah, and that can go a little that can go a little that can go a little <laughs> that can go left very quickly. Yes. So I wanted to talk before before I get too off topic, because I will get off topic. Oh, okay. um, uh, you did some amazing camps during the pandemic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell us a bit about those and how they happened. Sure. Like, unfortunately, it was very short because the pandemic took over. So yeah. I took off and I went to the Caribbean. I was in St. Vincent. I stayed amongst three islands primarily. So say, it's St. Vincent and the Grenadines. St. Vincent is the mainland. And then it has about 32 um, islands, Grenadine, 
islands. And so I was in Bekwe, Kanoan, and Union Island. Those are three very small islands. I think none of them are bigger than like five square miles wide. They're very small islands. And um, so these islands are very small. A lot of the time, like the people living on certain islands, so Kanoan is one, for example. Um, people, if you're living on the island as a local, you're usually just there to work. They okay. have a resort. And so if they're there, they're most likely just working on the resort, working other jobs. So a lot of the times the kids go to school, they come home and they're really taking care of themselves and looking after themselves because there's nothing else to do. Interesting. Um, so my friend who's a local, well, she's not a local, but her family is local there. Um, she started doing like after school programs. So she would bring the kids and they would do school and the idea was to give the kids something to do, show them structure, show them that, um, like, there's more to look forward to in life. Mm -hmm. um, so we involved school, we involved boxing, um, exercise, and, like, really just anything. But obviously, for me, like, that's my niche, and that's what I'm, I'm good at. And so we incorporated that. And it was lovely. Like, it was so nice because otherwise what the kids do is they just go to the beach, which is, there's nothing wrong with that. But some kids, they don't always want to be in the water. You know what I mean? Some kids don't know how to swim, but a lot of them do out there. But, and like, just like anywhere in the world, you become normalized to what you have. So right. going to the beach every day after school is really not something that you're looking to do. And then when you get introduced to something like boxing, something that you could never imagine, um because you come from such a small place, right? So that was lovely. It was very, very short, unfortunately, because- But the kids took to boxing, they took to boxing and- Yeah. And they liked it. Yeah, they took, yeah, because it was so introduced, like, like, like I said, these are small islands. Some of these kids have never even been to the mainland. Wow. Um, some of them don't have TVs. They don't have, you know, phones and the technology that we have to have access to other parts of the world. And some of them like to fight. So it's, you know, it, it, what I liked is that the culture is different. You know, here you can bring kids into a gym and they're actually scared to punch each other. They're scared right. to fight, and, you know. So you go out there and, like, these kids want to fight. But it's good to have it in a controlled environment. And I noticed, right. like, for me, I've always gravitated to, like, the more troubled, troubled some kids, I will say, is what, you know, people would perceive them as but as you get to know them they're really just misunderstood and right. it's those kids that just need the pick me up just need the support just need the structure, structure. yeah and there's a lot of kids out there that that needed that and so for me it was like super warming and I loved it like it was um something that I would really like to do later on when mm -hmm. I know that like I can consistently be there and be um you know, heavily involved with it regularly. And I love that we were able to give you a bit of gear to bring out to the kids and use for yes. the coaching, which was fun. That was great. That was honestly, it, and it, that's what made it possible to do what we were doing, right? It wouldn't have been the same other than actually just doing drills and non-contact stuff, but being right. able to like do hand pads and all of that was different and like it was like an upgrade <laughs> well we look forward to you doing more in the future and of course we'll help you out with those and Most definitely and so okay because we could talk forever and we're already getting close to our I hour know. so we're, we're gonna go over because there's some things to talk about so we're gonna yes it in and we're gonna go back to how did you end up uh going back going to africa and fighting so explain that little that little journey all right um i had a lot of political conflict with the national team um and this is when you were working under adrian and that was 2016 2017 no at well over the years i had problems. Yeah. like i just wasn't getting mm. the development i wasn't getting the exposure i wasn't getting the competition even if i was winning i still wasn't being sent places um people were being sent in my like people were being sent be to competitions that i wasn't even aware of and like there was a lot of conflict right as we as all usual. know as, yeah, usual. as we all know <laughs> Um, so eventually, unfortunately, um, Adrian passed away, rest his soul. Um, I was training with Dwight for a little bit. Um, mm -hmm. I really like training with Dwight as well. Um, and from Dwight, I started training with, um, Stevie Bailey. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and it's when I was- Inguel. Pardon? Inguel. 
Yeah, in Guelph. So I've been a little bit of everywhere. Some people shame it. Some people don't. I got Absolutely everything not. I needed from every coach. Mm -hmm. I respect every single coach I've worked with. And I have a good relationship with every single one of them till this day. Um, so finally, when I was training with Stevie, um, again, still dealing with so much conflict and not wanting to deal with it any longer. Mm -hmm. Um long story short it was actually just the consideration that i like a thought spewing in my head about doing this and i got a call from sierra leone them asking if i would want to go and compete out there now what's your connection was oh my mother's sierra leonean she's born and raised in sierra leone um mm -hmm. and so that's how i'm also sierra leonean by birth but i'm born here yep um and so however everything works i believe in god so for me that higher power he heard my prayers he heard my thoughts and i got a call in amongst me trying to figure out what the hell i wanted to do with boxing at this point because i wasn't competing right so i jumped on it i think they called me like three weeks before they were having their national championship and they said hey deidre we have a national championship do you want to come and compete i was like sure <laughs> i dropped everything <laughs> why not why not? Um, it was more than just the boxing too, right? My mom finally got to go home after over 30 years of being here, not seeing her mother, not seeing her wow. family. That was our first first time in Sierra Leone. So boxing is what brought us back home. And boxing was Amazing. what brought my family together. And um, I was able to to do like great things. I'm the first female to ever represent Sierra Leone across the world. And that, um, And that title is what? This year, the Sierra Leone national champion. So the first ever fe like Sierra female Sierra ever national champion, and the first to represent Sierra Leone across any international competition. They'd never had a national boxer before me. A national female boxer or national boxer? national female boxer. They did have okay. males, um, okay. and like very similar to me. There was one in particular. I forget his name, and I should know his name. Um, but he was Sierra Leone, he is Sierra Leonean, born in Italy, and he represented Sierra Leone um, at an Olympic competition. I believe okay. it was 2012. Wow. So, mm -hmm. so now we also, we didn't touch on this, but you also had some injuries, right? <laughs> yeah. Along the way that you've had to deal with amongst all the other things. Yeah. Um, I, you know, I love to tell the story when I was yeah. in your corner at the nationals and this girl fought with a shoulder. <laughs> a dislocated shoulder. A dislocated shoulder. And I yeah. remember watching being like, oh, there's something going on. She's only throwing <laughs> the one side punches. Still winning. Still winning. Still win so your pain yeah. tolerance is next level, but that's like that's exceptional, a... <laughs> like scary. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, you can't say this girl doesn't have heart. So no. you, you, yeah. you take this opportunity, you go to Africa, you get to all just be with your family, which is so cool. Mm -hmm. um, and boxing, you know, being an international national athlete at any level, any sport just brings so much opportunity, right? Mm -hmm. And experience. Yeah. And, but this is really special and unique. So mm -hmm. you, you then like also for your family, right? Mm -hmm. It brings your family yeah. together and they're like, Deidre came back, not just to visit. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> to win the national championship. Mm -hmm. I <laughs> so know. So how, how that must have felt really good and really, really special. First of all, they are so passionate and so loving. And it was amazing. Like, you are treated the way you're supposed to be treated. And I'm not talking about the Boxing Association. I'm talking about my people. Right. They're very welcoming. They're very warm. They have almost nothing, but they'll give you everything they have. Wow. And so for me to go out there, A, it was like almost a shine of light to like be very humbled for what I have and the opportunity I have because some people don't. Um, right. But it was also like, I don't even know how to put it. Like the, the stadium is like terrible. The stadium needs work. But that stadium was packed, you know? Wow. And there's a lot of cultural drumming. They have like... The, like the, they I, I think they had the drums there they had singers there they had dancers there and it was wow. like a whole festivity around but it was really around boxing um and so it was beautiful to see the culture and boxing and how and they celebrate like, the sport it sounds amazing yeah or to celebrate like their people in sport was amazing yeah so I guess that's an experience that you've never had before and you never rose, rose to the occasion and yeah. 
And so, and then I think shortly after that, the pandemic hit. Is that correct? Very sure. So the following year. So I did the uh, African Games in Morocco. Um, I lost in the semifinals. That was a very questionable loss. I lost against Nigeria. Um, mm -hmm. But that's, it's okay. Like, But what like, an experience. The African Games. What an experience, right? Can I tell you something? So I yes. did not know that I did not know that a lot of Sierra Leoneans actually go to Morocco as refugees. So okay. I'm going to Morocco thinking I'm just going with my boxing association and nobody else. They got word on the street that they had some Sierra Leonean boxers there. And when I was there at the semi, I'm so I'm getting goosebumps right now. When I was there at the Sierra Leone Boxing Association, I'm like, man, we're against Nigeria. And anywhere you go, Nigeria is one of the biggest teams. Um, so we get there and I see like, you know, one person with the Sierra Leonean jersey and then one other. And I when it's time for me to walk in to the stadium, I go in and the entire stadium on my left side is Sierra Leoneans. Wow. They had the flags. They had I just the got crowd, chills. They had, yeah. <laughs> and I was like, so like, that was probably the biggest, the, the busiest stadium I was going to be in. So I'm like, wow. man, now this, I was like, for me, like, this is like hat on be as focused, high alert as you can be, because right. you're going to hear the Nigerians. <laughs> that was the biggest thing. You're going to hear them and you're going to see them. But when I walked out and I saw my people, it was like the most like uplifting experience I've had. And it, you know what? That's probably comparable to the Olympics, right? Oh, like that experience, if not even, if not better. Probably better because I probably wouldn't have a big um, Sierra Leone community at the Olympics like I did in Morocco. So that was like amazing. There was easily over a hundred of them in that stadium, easily. So that's that's amazing. That's a super yeah. high to continue what you thought you were going to continue, and then yeah. the pandemic, right? Yeah, and then the pandemic hit, um, and it hit a week. I think like two two weeks officially is when it really affected boxing. Um, so I yeah. did do the Olympic qualifiers for 2020. Right. Um, I was not supposed to be there, but I took a risk that I don't regret taking um, mm. because I that that was I was only like 30 days post op from my shoulder reconstruction that I had. <laughs> so my surgeon actually did not <laughs> be okay to go out there. Right. But I. Said, I said to him, right, because I had a plate put in, not a plate, sorry, but I had screws and pins put in. I said, if I go out there and I do anything, I know my muscles are weak and I don't have the strength to throw punches, but will I damage the hardware that's in my shoulder? Right. Said, no, that's not my concern. So in my head, I said, well, that's that was my concern. So as, yeah. as long as I'm not going to cause more damage, you know, I was going out there on a, on a risk, you know, hoping – depending on how the draw went, if anything went in my favor. Unfortunately, it didn't. And I was ready to be fully rehabilitated for the world championships. And mm -hmm. that got that got canceled. And then that's when COVID took over. Right. So let's just like sideline for a second about this injury. When did this start, the <laughs> shoulder injury? Because I always kind of remember you having the shoulder issue. Right. But, but yeah, when did it start? So I first subluxed, so separated my shoulder probably in like 2013, 2014. Mm -hmm. So from 2014 up until 2020, sorry, up until 2019, yeah. I was always boxing with a bum shoulder. I just, I didn't even know what it meant. I didn't know what it was like to box with a normal shoulder. With a healthy shoulder. Okay. So, yeah. and I know you... <laughs> Had a couple fights where you fought with your shoulder out. So Completely that's dislocated. Other, yeah. That's the whole thing. But now, now, how is the shoulder and how is it like, the, did the pandemic give your shoulder time to heal? It did. Mm -hmm. um, it did. I had another shoulder injury post op, post rehabilitation, mm. shattered my collarbone. Oh, that was I, an accident, right? That was an accident. Yeah. That was a car, uh, no, car accident or bike a accident? motorcycle accident. Yeah. But in the mid, that was at the beginning of the pandemic as well. So my shoulder yeah. is, <laughs> my shoulder is solid. I do you have a bionic solid at this shoulder point. now. You have a bionic shoulder. Yeah. What it, I have a bionic shoulder and I have a bionic knee because I have a plate in my knee as well because I had to do reconstruction on my knee. 
Um, but before that <laughs> second injury, my shoulder was great. Like, um, I had gone back into the gym. I was fully sparring and stuff like that. And it was amazing. And Stevie was like, I, he's like, I've never, that, that was a punch that we could never, ever get was my left hook. I never had the strength that I needed behind it because I never had the right. stability in my shoulder. So right. post-op, like, I, I was like amazed at what difference it made but you wow. don't know you don't know right i never knew what it was like to have a healthy shoulder i Helene's was just, asking sorry helene's asking if it was a left or right shoulder left that was shoulder. left so and yeah. you're and you're orthodox fighter right or you southpaw i'm an orthodox fighter okay yeah. so your jab hand was so was i can jab solid working. right because your jab is inside my issue was anything that was like outside of the median so if i was jabbing, i always had a solid jab Okay. Um, it did start to weaken where if I was jabbing and somebody punched my arm, my shoulder would go out. People didn't know that. So now I can say it because now you can it. say it. Ooh. Yeah, it's not an issue. But like I there, there was points where like I would just like making contact with somebody else's arm and my shoulder would go out. But yeah. I always had a strong jab. My issue was any rotation. What's that was the name my of the issue. surgery that you got? What was the name? So of the, the surgery? first surgery was a ladder, a ladder J procedure. So okay. what happens is I dislocated my shoulder so much that I had lost almost like 30 to 40% of the socket. Wow. So what they do is they basically form like a bumper to, mm -hmm. to replace the bone that was missing. And it's called the ladder J procedure. That's the first procedure that I had. And okay. then the second one was um, like a clavicle reconstruction. From the accident. Okay. That's right. So, yeah. Yeah. so, so now we're, Amazing career so far. Amazing opportunities. Yeah. High pain threshold. <laughs> Very high. Yeah. Pandemic I don't like pain meds. Here, but you're okay Say that again? I said now, and then you get through the pandemic, had some time to kind of rest and recover, and then you had a huge opportunity to fall in your lap. So we're going to talk about that because you can. Yeah, I can. Absolutely. Okay. So yeah, yeah. tell us about the opportunity to be involved with the Clarissa Shields movie that was, that was filmed in Toronto. Right. So the movie's called Flint Strong. I can talk about things that the public knows. So the movie is called okay. Flint Strong. It's really based on Clarissa Shields and her story about her um her journey in boxing um and winning two Olympic medals and like the amount of treatment and the lifestyle that she had to endure and what she still endures up until this day. Um, but you don't you only see her amateur side of the boxing. Um or that's what it's about. I think I think that's what it's about primarily. Um, and what was your role? What was the opportunity for you? I was the boxing double for Ryan Destiny, who plays Clarissa in the movie. And that's amazing. Like, what a huge opportunity <laughs> and so much fun. And, you know, can you talk about a little bit, you know, so this is an interesting thing to talk about. Like, what are the opportunities for women in the sport of boxing? What are some transition opportunities? Because you got to the highest of the highest ranks, won the titles, been on the national, had that experience. And then to have, you know, you're trying to figure out what did you want to do next? And then this amazing opportunity came up. And now, now you're on a set. Now you're in a movie set. Now you're a boxing stunt coordinator you're you're trying all these amazing things like how was how did that differ and I know there's big differences from being on set to being in the ring so what was the hardest thing for you transitioning from a real fight situation to a stunt fight situation learning how to like fake punch somebody to like be super fast but not hard and like learn how to like fake take like the hat the whole process exaggeration of the taking yeah punch, right? and yeah. throwing punches completely wrong yeah right like they want big exaggerated motions and we're always like go keep camera. it tight and clean yeah um so that was tricky but again i'm very adaptable so it took like a couple of days it didn't take more than a week for me yeah. to get used to i was also amongst like people that had previously done some stuff before the pandemic so with their guidance um nick alkiotis is a legend boxing um like a fight coordinator so i he took me under his wing and i'm forever grateful to work with him he's worked on he worked with mark simmons on cinderella man and so many other great movies um even outside of the boxing movies and stuff like that we had the film 
um, some of the production team did Creed. So they flew out from Creed and then they flew in to do, you know, Flynn Strong and stuff like that. So I was fortunate enough to be, again, thrown to the wolves because I had, like, <laughs> there was so many times they'd say something like, I don't know what that means. I'm not in film. Like, I'm a boxer, you know? So um, it was, again, very humbling, very difficult. Like, it was challenging, super long days. Um, mm -hmm. I think the most challenging part for me was because I was the lead character and it's a boxing movie. I had to learn every fight. So, so being I, the double of the lead character, um, did you have to step in for her? Did she do all her own stunts? Did you have to do some, or did you just like how was how did that work? Are you um, I won't I won't say <clears throat> that part of the okay, of, but I will say how it works. So usually sure. how it, how it works is um, you, you do both right because you do need their facial shots in movies and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. So um, if if she's doing like she they will film her and they will also film me where I'm needed. And it's yeah. like that anywhere in, in film. And so um, in this case, sometimes if they're doing wide shots, they'll use the boxing doubles because sometimes you're on set for like 18, 19 hours, right? Right. And the character, you still have acting scenes to do and whatnot. Like you try to preserve the, the actresses and actors. So I would be there and they would use me to give the actress a break. They would use me to go over the process, like go over choreography or if changes needed to be made made because mm -hmm. she's not a boxer instead of overwhelming her they would use me to you know make the changes to the choreography and then we would go over it together boxing double and actress so that we're both making the same movements right so, so whenever anything is being edited whether it's her or me we look the same and we're doing the same movements from different angles and whatnot very cool was Clarissa ever on set never so you didn't you didn't get a chance to meet her through the process no have you met her before through competitions? Um, I don't think so, right? At competitions, no. Right. We've, we've crossed paths. We've never officially met. So so this movie, so how how you were filming for quite a few months. Yeah. Long, long days. Mm -hmm. <laughs> You've now recovered. You did a little bit of traveling after for a, lot. a bit of a break. Yeah. Um, do you, are, do, when is it slated to actually uh, premiere? Do you know? I have no idea, to be honest with you. I'm not even sure. A, and a actually, us, mm -hmm. go ahead. Go, go ahead. ahead. Or, no, a couple of us have asked, but I, we haven't gotten an answer. So that I'm not too sure. Okay. And also the female director, right? A lot of, a lot of women yes. on set. I think primarily women, which was great. Like, Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. It's going give to it, give it a different, uh, you know, a different viewpoint, if you will. Yes, and uh, what I appreciate is they went to the lengths to make the boxing scenes as official to boxing as possible. So, for example, like, they um, would make sure, like, we're not, it's, it's, it's not just about the boxing, right? Like, right. the Olympics look official. Everything has, has been done to how boxing is supposed to be done. So it's quality. It's so it's, it's, quality. It's, it's the kind of movie, I think, that can really... Uh, leave a mark on women's boxing get younger girls really excited about it um you know it's those types of movies that you know back in the day girl boxer right and yeah and girl one of fight my and all those ones. yeah <laughs> yeah girl fight um one of my well, that's actually one of my favorite movies and the stunt coordinating assistant she told me that I don't know um, what her role was in girl fight but that was the first movie that she did her very she, cool her, her stunt career on so that was super cool too so yeah. has this kicked off your stunt career now is that going to be part of where where you start going with with boxing tell us what's next for apparently the lioness. apparently so um i did another tv episode for a series i'm not gonna say because i'm not sure if i'm allowed okay. to keep it like that but it was super cool um and then in this scene it was a fight scene, but not a boxing fight scene. So really, I'm like stabbing people and strangling <laughs> people and hitting people. And I'm just like, <laughs> You've le I didn't know this up. stuff was all this fake. But I mean, it gets yeah. edited really well. And so I, what, I did have another stunt job before the end of summer on a TV episode um, in a fight. And again, was I actually... Was it Canadian or American it. show? Uh, I think it might be American. Hmm. I think it might be American. And um, again, I was doubling the lead character on that show as well. 
So that was super cool. That's very cool. So do you have an agent now? There's no agents in stunts. And it's funny because all of a sudden people like, they're like, don't get scammed and don't get yourself an agent because there is an agent in, in stunts. And mm. so a lot of the time stunts is by who you know, um, right. previous experience. And so is, I think is that the advice like for, for fellow boxers who are looking to female boxers? Because I think it's a very unique opportunity. I mean, to, to get into stunts. When I was younger, I did some uh, stunt courses and it's it's a lot of fun it's a lot of fun yeah um i'm still so new to it i'm not ready to give anybody advice. <laughs> like <laughs> give yourself <laughs> advice <laughs> i yeah because i'm still trying to get my own advice right i mean i'm still trying to figure it out along the way um but i think i mean social media is probably your best bet if i'm being very honest with you um but one thing i will say and this comes from like i'm sorry stunt legends there they just say there is no agents in mm. in stunts. so Very if somebody comes to you and they tell you that they're gonna be your agent that really is your choice and at your own expense but um they don't they like a lot of the time the they, when they are hiring stunt performers, they choose not to even communicate with the agents either, and they want to communicate right. directly with the stunt performer. Directly with the stunt person. Okay, so that's super exciting. You're going to keep going with that. Um, what's next in the boxing world? Have you thought it through? I know, you know, we're trying to get you to do some coaching with us and start yeah. working with us on the coaching side. And you mm -hmm. know, you're a fantastic ambassador for Girls Just Want to Box, but. Thank you. Know, you. What, what are you looking to do next in the boxing world? Is pro on the horizon? I know that's what a lot of people were asking. Yeah, it's definitely something that I've been considering over the years, even before I actually went out to box for Sierra Leone as well. Um, right. I think right now, I like in this very moment, I just I just want to get finished school. I know I'm still young. In a what are you taking in school? Nursing. And I'm in my final year of nursing right now. So I really only have like six months left of studying. So my focus right now is a just staying active, but not training like a boxer. When the pandemic happened, I was training like I was still a boxer and I completely burnt myself out. Right. Um. So I'm trying to remove myself from that, comp like remove that competitive hat for right, right now. And that's actually my biggest challenge. Like it's so mm -hmm. hard to yep. just like, enjoy a workout for the sake of it for your wellness and your well-being and your mental health and like what other people can do I really struggle to do because I'm like no like I'm competition by the books and that's how I've always exercised right, right? right. um but it's very it's it, that in itself is not always a healthy lifestyle and right. so that is what I'm working on right now is just being able to enjoy exercise mm -hmm. be active and and still have balance in my life especially that i'm in school right now yep um whatever i do decide it will probably be like spring of next year okay. um, but not off the table like there's really nothing off of the table right now turning pro is definitely something i'd consider i know that they're doing olympic qualifiers again next year for sierra leone so these are all things that i still have in the horizon Okay, so we have a question that came through about what would you uh, tell your younger self as a boxer now? And what's that advice to younger boxers? Um, I think I've said it like on other interviews as well. I think my biggest thing is being able to step out of your comfort zone. Mm. Boxing is a very uncomfortable sport. And part of the sport that that's what part of the sport is, right? You're always, you're not always, but you're under pressure. You're often in very unfamiliar territory um and so it's okay like being able to embrace that you're uncomfortable and out of your comfort zone is what will allow you to grow and so don't let that limit your growth that's the biggest thing i would say i was fortunate enough that i didn't do that mm -hmm. um so i would encourage my younger wild risk-taking self to keep doing that um because I know so many people that limited themselves just because they didn't want to leave their coach or they didn't want to leave their gym or they didn't want to travel or they didn't know what the outcome was. And there's right. so many risks I took and I had no idea what the outcome was, but I didn't care because right. I knew whatever, at the end of the day, win or lose, I'm taking away a lesson from that experience. For sure. For sure. So, I mean, I, I can talk to you forever, but we're going to have to wrap this up. No, that's okay. Point. Yeah. So, 
Um, aside from, you know, having advice to younger boxers, male or female, and, and moving forward, what do you see, what do you wish for the future of women's boxing? Right? Um, like, what, like, do you want there to be three minute rounds? Do you want? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. So you're on, you're on the side of three minute rounds. Give us a quick, a quick reason why. Uh, I'm on the side of three minute rounds because I feel like within like a minute and a half, you're just like warming up. You're right? just warmed up. Yeah. Personally, everyone's true. different. I mean, if you're a very active boxer and you like your go, 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 and like your strength is like your activity and your output, that's different. Mm -hmm. You don't want a three, three minute round. But if you're somebody that likes to try new things, you know, it's a very like, it's a huge mind game. And if you want to be able to study your opponent, so that you can, you know, try your own tactics right. throughout that. I I believe that the three minutes is necessary. In two mm -hmm. minutes, you don't have enough time to study your opponent. In female boxing, the benefit had always been that you're fighting the same person over and over again. You don't need that three minutes to study right. your Right. The sport has grown immensely. You can yeah. go to competition and see people that you've never seen before. You need those three minutes to study your opponent, make the adjustments throughout the round. Whereas when we we're fighting, you know, two minutes, I'm like, I'm, I'm, I'm just getting started. You know what I mean? And so the argument is the argument is that it's safer for women to do two minutes. How do you feel about that? It only takes one punch and that's in a millisecond for something to go completely left. So two minutes mm -hmm. to three minutes, I don't think that's even an argument. Boxing is, 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 a, is a, is practiced safely, but it's a mm -hmm. high risk sport. So Correct. whether it's two minutes or three minutes, you're in the ring, same as the men, doing the same exact thing across mm -hmm. the board. And we all know the game can change in a split second. So Correct. you can't tell me that you're raising the risk for three minutes when you have amateurs fighting three minutes. Correct. <laughs> and that's right. Yeah. So yeah. I, yeah. I can't even I can't even entertain in that argument because anybody with sense would make the comparison and amateur is supposed to be safer than pros, right? So Correct. if that's the case, if they can do it three minutes as an amateur, you should be able to do it three minutes as a pro. So so we have a question from uh, Bettina and she's asking, you know, when you were in that, how did you become comfortable being uncomfortable? <sighs> you know <laughs> is that just your personality like are you okay yeah yeah <laughs> i'll be honest part of that is my personality but believe it or not reading was what enlightened me to be aware of myself in uncomfortable situations so understanding the mental side of your game by you know understanding um the mental side of the sport is that is that what you're saying there Oh, no, I used to read like a lot of self development books, like or spiritual yeah. development books or whichever, like both really understanding yourself. Like yeah. So I learned that it's like, as if you can understand yourself, you can understand others. And so reading is what allowed Liz to open my eyes to awareness. Because mm -hmm. I it is my personality to be able to step into like very uncomfortable situations. I don't shy away from them. Mm -hmm. But um you know, getting knowledge outside the sport is what made it easier for me to be like, okay, if I'm in this uncomfortable situation, what are things that I should look for in myself? What are things I should look for in the room? What are things that I should look for in that whole situation and look at the big picture? And so really reading, um, and it doesn't have to be reading anymore. I mean, there's so many podcasts, there's so many like right. resources, you can watch, listen, you know, but go outside of boxing but bring that with you in your in your sport and the person that you are. But same thing, skills that you learn in boxing, don't leave it there. Bring it with you in your everyday practice because realistically, the sport of boxing is how we live our life every day. We challenge ourselves every day across the board in different things. Like I said, I learned adaptability. I learned discipline, structure, time management, nutrition, all of these things. I can't live my life without these things right you know what i mean these are my everyday things but that's where my foundation came from and so the same thing me being able to read and do research and learn about people that was something i was passionate about was something that i brought into the sport of boxing and that's when i was able to learn emotional quotient eq that's when i excelled in being able to seek opportunities and grow in uncomfortable situations
And I, I think boxing can teach women so much about themselves, their bodies, their their mental states, their, you know, it can help them feel so empowered and really feel good about themselves in their body that they can then bring that confidence into any other real life situation, correct? Absolutely. Most definitely. Absolutely. So, yeah. so we're going to kind of roll this into um kind of the end of the conversation any more questions any more questions yeah if there's um, any questions thank you to everyone for who tuned in like so many people tuned in that's amazing and we're gonna we're gonna um kind of edit it and repost it so people can watch it and be inspired by you Deidre and your journey and your resolve and we love having you on our ambassador team thank um, you and okay so this is totally out of the, the gear that you've used from Girls Just Want to Box, how important do you think it is to have boxing gear that fit women properly? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> like, absolutely. Last um, question. <laughs> no, I think it's so important. First of all, I, okay, so I'm a girly girl. Like, I like colors and stuff like that. Not every, and actually, even guys do. Guys like pink, yeah. like purple. Like, you know what I mean? And so it's fun to have that. Um, but I think it's also very important to have things that fit you correctly. Um, I'll use this as an example. I know that that's not a focus for us, but like a lot of the times back in the day, in two thousand early two thousand, yeah, you know, they we would have male cups oftentimes. Don't get um, me started. <laughs> you know, so these are things where it's just like I'm not gonna lie. So the girls a lot, which is bad. Yeah. Sorry, off off the top all like you know but yeah. we would lie about wearing cups because they were so uncomfortable and they were so limiting and like if they wanted a pocket wear... for what was the pocket for there's snacks <laughs> like i don't was the pocket for i don't understand <laughs> you know <laughs> actually funny enough though adrian would used to drop our mouthpieces in our tops um like he would just open it and drop it like after the fight and whatnot and I saw somebody do that in their cup one day. <laughs> I thought, I was like, I, I mean, I know that we're not filling in that pocket. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But it's close enough to areas you don't really want your mouthpiece to go to. Um, so that is my biggest example. Um, right. And, and having women make products for women is great. Because um, we know what we need, right? And so, yeah. like, again, the breast protectors... I mean, that was like at one point you're basically putting a plate and then taking a blow to the chest. That Horrible. was more painful than just not wearing one, right? And that's and why a lot of women don't wear them and they don't wear the groin gourd. But even even from having gloves that fit you properly, you're going to protect your hands and the longevity absolutely. of yourself in the sport, right? Yeah, no, for sure. Absolutely. We can get ones that allow you to wear nails. No, I'm totally joking. Now we totally can. <laughs> you totally just size up a little bit. It's you know, totally where you can sense. like sit your nails in them so that they don't. I've broken nails so many times. I like to get my it's nails so painful. Like so so painful. yeah, it's very painful. <laughs> that I was just joking about. But I mean, if you do come up with it, I promise you, there'll probably be a lot of girls. I'll be happy for that. <laughs> I mean, we have talked about, you know, there's a couple of, we'll, we'll have a special, a special, uh, <laughs> a fitting we're gonna do a fitting live so we'll show how and another thing is that we don't know what we don't know so this is the last thing we'll say on the gloves if you've always just worn gloves that were too big for your hands you don't know any different right <clears throat> right so then putting on a glove that fits you're like oh even the coaching gear right having uh -huh. coaching gear that fits properly to help us with the longevity of ourselves in the sport right um you know etc cetera, etc cetera. so i'm gonna let you go and enjoy the rest of your sunday Thank uh, you. We look forward. We've had some some people mention they can't. Our other ambassadors, they can't wait to meet you. We're gonna have you at some. Uh, we'll get you out to the sparring to help with some coaching. We'll get you in the ring, maybe with some of the girls. Yeah, and, of course. Um, we look forward to all things boxing lioness, and we Thank you. we will definitely talk to you soon. Thank you, everybody. Oh, girls just want to box nail polish. Okay, I'm thinking about it. I think yep. that's a good idea. <laughs> I think Deidre will be on the testing team for that 100%. Oh, no problem. I like to get my nails done. So. <laughs> awesome. Have a great day. Thank you. You too. Talk Bye. To you soon. Bye. Okay. I've got to figure out how to close this out so I don't lose this. Thanks for everybody for tuning in. Coming soon. Girls just want a box nail polish. It, it, hey, we have Protect the Pretty Spray already, which is pretty amazing. So don't think we won't do it. Thanks again, everybody.